So I want to thank you all first so much for coming. My name is Forrest Dunbar, and as most of you know, I grew up here in Cordova. Thank you for joining me at Mount Eccles Elementary, site of much of my childhood embarrassment. <laughs> it was here that I first learned my multiplication tables, first discovered the joys of geography, and first realized that I was not going to be a professional athlete. <laughs> now I know what many of you are thinking. Isn't that guy a little too old to be interested in politics? <laughs> I started working and volunteering in public policy so long ago, no one outside of Wasilla, Wasilla knew what a Sarah Palin was. <laughs> and the Wasillans have a decency to keep it to themselves. <laughs> Seriously though, uh, my first experience in politics was an internship for then Senator Frank Murkowski back in 2002 when I was only 17 years old. I've been involved in policy and community building ever since. Like many people in this room, I also worked on fishing boats when I was in high school. And issues surrounding fishing are something I still care deeply about. Wherever I go and whatever I do, those experiences will always come with me. And I promise you this, I will burn Capitol Hill to the ground before I eat farm salmon there. <laughs> said, uh, I really wasn't a very good fisherman. Uh, little Freddie called me a landlubber on a couple of times, and uh, I have to admit he was right. When my family moved to Fairbanks uh, after I finished high school, I, stocked, uh, <clears throat> I worked jobs that kept me firmly on shore. I stocked shelves at Fred Meyer, I washed trailers from semi-trucks that came up the highway, and I dug trenches on the fire line as a member of the North Star Fire crew out of Fort Wainwright. Those jobs helped define my youth, and they taught me, first and foremost, about the value of hard work. It's a value that defines towns all over this state, from Cordova to Fairbanks, from Haines to Bethel to Barrow to Anchorage. Hard work is what this state is about, hard work and opportunity. And it's because of those opportunities that our state's population is growing. In just over 20 years' time, there are going to be one million people living here in Alaska. I'm sure that you or your parents remember a time that number seemed impossible. When my parents moved to Alaska in 1978, the population was less than 400,000, and you could drive down every road in the Matsu Valley and never hit a traffic light. So what does it mean to be a state of a million people? It means Alaska is never returning to a state of nature. We are going to be a sustainable, fully functioning state for as long as this nation stands. It also means Alaska is entering a period in our history unlike any other that's come before. Broadly speaking, there have been three generations of Alaskan political leaders during our time as a state. First, there were the founders, the originators. They came to Alaska when it was still a territory. They pushed for statehood and they fought for equal treatment of all Alaska's residents. People like Bill Egan, Bob Bartlett, Ernest Groening, and Elizabeth Bradovich. This group was followed by a second generation, right around the time the oil started flowing down the pipeline. They solidified our position in the American Union. People like Jay Hammond, Willie Hensley, and Wally Hickel. There were leaders, of course, that spanned both generations. The most prominent, was Ted Stevens, our Uncle Ted. Senator Stevens and his allies did a tremendous job of ensuring that Alaska, as a young state, received funds to develop our infrastructure as the lower 48 had done. But now we are entering a third period. It's an era where the state is already established and where it'll have a larger population than ever before and will look less and less like the territory of our great-grandparents. We're facing falling federal budgets, in a very uncertain future for our oil industry. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but someday, that resource is going to dry up. The scary view of these trends is that, with more people and less oil, we're destined to become impoverished again, destined to grow ever more dependent on federal dollars. But it doesn't have to be that way. <coughs> this third era requires a new generation of Alaskans. A generation that helps Alaska look towards new sources of job growth. A generation who doesn't just seek to contribute our natural resources to the nation, 
but also our ideas, our culture, the values passed down by our elders, our labor, and our leadership. And I am hugely optimistic because we are seeing this new generation of Alaskans emerge. In private industry, they are enabled by the internet and the ability to access ideas and markets all over the world. We're more than halfway through the speech now, guys. It's great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you for going, coming and, and eating our spaghetti. <laughs> so we see this new energy in our fishing industry, right here in Cordova, where innovators are pioneering, pioneering direct marketing and branding. We see it in the growth and strength of Alaska's universities. We see it in our Alaska Native corporations and in a generation of young Alaska Native leaders who are both connected to their traditional values and trained to be leaders in every sector of our economy. We see it in the statewide efforts to find alternative energy solutions for our rural areas and in the growth of rapid prototyping, maker spaces, and high-tech companies in Anchorage. These trends are only going to accelerate as GCI fiber lines enter Anchorage's homes in 2015. Do you realize that two kids from Cordova High School just designed a game for the iPad in their apartment in Anchorage? How cool is that? Long live Street Wizard. <laughs> now this generation is always also emerging in our political life. In the State House, my friend Jonathan Christ Tompkins is working with Alaska Native organizations to revive and protect indigenous languages in a way that someday may be a model for the entire nation. In the State Senate, leaders from both parties have come together to tackle criminal justice reforms from domestic violence and sexual assault to the public health crisis of drug addiction. These are leaders who are willing to try new approaches, put aside old prejudices, and whose successes are going to be examples for other states. <coughs> Finally, we see this new generation of leaders in our U.S. Senate delegation. We saw it when Lisa Murkowski and Mark Begich joined together to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, giving any man or woman the chance to put on, their put on the uniform and fight for the country they love. Both Senators, thank you. Both Senators have become influential by trending towards the center, by keeping an open mind, and by recognizing that Alaska has a unique leadership role to play in Arctic policy. We need this same forward-thinking approach in the House of Representatives. We need a Congress that understands what the exploding cost of college is doing to this generation of Americans. Too many Alaskans get trapped under a mountain of student loan debt that keeps us from buying homes and starting businesses. Now more than ever, we need a Congress that can work with universities to help them lower their costs so the savings are passed on to students and families. As you may have guessed, I don't believe our current congressman is up to this task. While Don Young has done great things for this state during his time as representative, and he was the quintessential second generation leader, his effectiveness in Congress has come to an end. It's striking that during our recent government shutdown, Congressman Young's name was never mentioned as a leader who could help resolve it. He is the longest serving member of the party that controls the House of Representatives yet takes no personal responsibility for its failings. And it is failing. His old style of amassing seniority and power on committees has been sunk by a changing world, a changing Washington, and by allegations of his own corruption. He is forbidden from, by his own party from chairing full committees. And his years of seniority bring Alaska no greater influence than a freshman legislator. Congressman Leung likes to attack Washington which is more than a little ironic. Teddy to, to, to quote Teddy Roosevelt, if you kick the person in the pants responsible for most of your trouble, you wouldn't sit for a month. <laughs> so the time has come for a major change, a change that reflects how Alaska itself is shifting. We need a representative in Washington who takes a different approach. We need a representative who can stand before Congress and declare, Alaska is no longer a distant backwater. We are not a junior partner. We are not a territory on the edge of an American empire. We are a full member of the United States of America with the talent and drive to compete on the national international stage. We have one-tenth of the oil production of this country. 
one-fifth of its land mass, and 100% of its Copper River salmon. <laughs> We are capable of more than our current congressman believes, and perhaps capable of more than we ourselves can imagine. So today, I am proud to announce that I am running for the United States Congress. I'm running because I believe in Alaska, in its people, and in its future. But I'm also running because we have to act now to secure that future. If you share the sense that now is the time, then please, come join us. Join us online, join us on the phones, join us in registering new voters. Join us in living rooms and coffee shops and meeting halls all across the state as we visit your hometown and get your input on the future of Alaska. We'd love to speak with you, and we'd love for you to join our campaign as we help bring Alaska into the bright future it was destined for. Thank you, and God bless.